So you know, people think there's something unusual about Coke because the formula is secret. It's in a vault in a bank. And quite frankly, the, the secrecy means nothing. Because he says that eventually, with food science going where, the way it was going, everyone would figure out how to make something close to Coca-Cola. But by the time they figured it out, we would have had brand and other things uh, come in which would, which would help us uh, kind of keep the competition at bay. And the, he said the food chemistry that helps our competitors make a product like ours also helps us by reducing the unit cost. You know, like, like they went in the US from sugar to fructose, which was a lot cheaper, and they just made their whole, all their efficiencies in, in how, they, how they got there. And then, you know, then he goes to Jacobi inversion, which is, you know, what not to do. You know, what are the things that you don't do uh, to get to the two trillion? So he says the first thing that you don't do is avoid losing half the brand name. So you know the Coca-Cola brand name uh, has two parts, the Coca and the Cola, right? And he says don't lose either part of it. If anyone came up with anything called Cola, sue them and take them out. And so he said that in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, he would have made sure there was no other Cola. They could call it whatever else, you know, Glotz bottled water or whatever, or carbonate, whatever, but no cola, right? So that's the first thing. He says you wouldn't lose half your brand name. You would avoid envy by basically having a standard great product at a great price, which they did. And then the final thing he said that, you know, don't change the flavor even if someone comes up with something better. Keep the flavor because it's not about the flavor, it's about the brand. And that brings us to the cola wars, which very few of you are familiar with. How many, how many of you are familiar with the Pepsi challenge? Yeah, the usual cast of characters, except you. How do you know about the Pepsi challenge? OK, all right, good. Uh, so some of us lived through the Pe Pepsi challenge. Did you take the Pepsi challenge? All right, there you go. So basically, Pepsi had a problem. In the, in the mid-'80s, they had a problem. They knew that people preferred Coke by a huge margin to Pepsi, by a, like a two-to-one margin. And they, they knew that their brand was inferior, uh, you know, if, if Burger King offered Pepsi and not Coke, then people would not think of Burger King as, use, as well. So every way they had to discount stuff and all these things, it was really hard for them. So John Scully, before he went to Apple, you know, he became he, the one who went to Apple and then ousted Steve Jobs. So before he went to Apple, John Scully was the chief marketing, marketing officer of Pepsi. So he was brilliant. He said, how do I take out Coke? He said, the way I take out Coke is I take away the brand name. And the way I take away the brand name is I ask consumers to do a blind taste test. And in a blind taste test, where you, so you know, if you put in front of someone a Coke and a Pepsi, they'd go for the Coke because of all that conditioning for the decades. But now if you take away the brand and you just give those, you know, those tasting cups um, and then have them taste it, well, Pepsi is sweeter. It actually tastes better, right? So in the blind taste test, people would say, oh, I prefer this one. Then they'd show you that it was Pepsi, right? And so they started taking market share and Coke got rattled. So Goizuera and Kio, who were part of Coke at that time, they got freaked out. They said, you know, basically these guys have figured out that our product is inferior. And so what they did is they came out with New Coke. And New Coke was sweeter, and it was better than Pepsi. And there was a major uproar, right? So all the diehard Coke guys were horrified that how can you change the formula? I mean, it's all about the formula. I want Coke, I don't want New Coke. Right? So there was this huge fiasco that now they had, they had messed with the family crown jewels. Right? They took away the, the one thing that was there, which was that secret formula and all the things about the secret formula. In reality, Coke had changed the formula many times, but they never told the public that they changed the formula. Right? They just did it quietly. This was very visible. They called it New Coke, and there was this huge backlash. And then they realized, the Coca-Cola company realized that they screwed up. So then they introduced classic Coke. Okay, so then there was new Coke and classic Coke. Do you remember that? We had both, right? That was even more confusing. Okay, and then they finally realized we've got to kill this whole thing, go back to just Coke. And that's what they did. They went back to only Coke and they survived that. So, uh, so what, what Munger says is that, look, this essay I wrote about taking two million to two trillion, he says in reality the company started in 1884. And by 1896, 12 years after they started, they had no earnings and they had 150,000 in total assets, so much less than two million they started with. He says they lost half their, bra their brand name, right? So they were not able to protect the cola part of the brand name. They lost that. And they also screwed up with uh, the, envy, the envy of Pepsi 
and they went to New Coke and all of that, right? So they did all these mistakes, and, uh, and they also had, uh, what they did, I think, in 1900, they didn't think bottling was going to be that big. They thought bottling is kind of a sideshow. So they signed these agreements with these bottlers, which fixed the price of syrup permanently into the future. So like in 1900, they said, we will give you syrup at whatever cents per pound for the next 100 years. Fixed price, OK? Uh, completely destroys the model, because then sugar went sky high, and they started losing money. So then they are telling the bottlers, we can't give it to you. They said, no, you have a contract. And so then they had to battle the bottlers, and finally they got some, uh, some leeway from that. So they made the, that mistake. And then what they had done is the, the bottling rights, what they had done originally when they gave bottling rights, it was a day's horse ride. So the way they set it up was that they looked at how far a horse could go in a day and a back, and that's how they defined the territory of a bottler. Okay, and that didn't make sense once you got to automobiles. And, and so, so first, they had very big territories because Coke started expanding. So they wanted to reduce those territories. The bottlers didn't want to give that up. And the second is that they had some many useless bottlers, right? So these, these bottlers, I mean, this is the license to print money. You got, you got a monopoly in an area. Uh, you got the Coke product is going to sell. And so you don't need to be that great a businessman. And so they had to really kind of go through, Don Keir did a lot of work, where they brought back a lot of bottlers and did all kinds of things to, to get their, their model back. But in spite of all that, uh, Coke from 1884 till now, with all the dividends they've given out, they're now at a, uh, Munger, Munger, when he gave the speech, the market cap was 125 million in, 18, in 1996. So he said if Coke's market value grows by about 7.5% a year, you'll get to 2 trillion from 96 to 2034. And if you go to today, of course, 96, I think it was an inflated uh, multiple. If you go to today, Coke is at 190 billion. To get to 2 trillion by 2034, you would need to be at about 14.5% a year. I'm not sure they'll do that. But the other thing that could happen by that time is since we get these cycles in stock markets, you might have a 30 multiple on the company. You know, Coke was sitting at a 40 multiple in 1999. So you, there's a chance you might get some crazy multiple at that time, and that might get you to, uh, uh, to the two trillion. So, um, so basically, what I wanted to just say is that um, you, you can see the work that Warren and Charlie did. Uh, so usually, the thing is, one is they, they get a little bit of information edge because they're willing to dig deep. You know, they're willing to read a lot and whatnot, uh, which most people aren't willing to do. The second is where they get a lot of advantage is the synthesis. You know, when they read, what are they kind of extracting out of that model? And the third is that they understand that when you have multiple, multiple model, models interplaying with each other, I mean, when you put a great manager like Goizueta on top of a great business, uh, you just get phenomenal returns. I mean, those are, those are just exceptional uh, in terms of what ends up happening, uh, is great business with a great manager. And then we get to some of these other nuances about personal space and all these other things about brand and, and such, uh, you, get to, uh, you get to kind of these lula loser effects. So in the, in the investment business, I think that um, this is the holy grail. You know, this is kind of when you get to this level of analysis on, on a business, uh, you got it. You know, and then, then, uh, then, then you got it there. And, and so the key is to make very few bets uh, make very infrequent bets, and uh, and when when seven moons line up, you uh, uh, you bet big, and uh, and such, and the rest of the time you don't do much. So